First, a word about the structure of the meditation, which uh, is for me grounded in the three fundamental ways of engaging our mind skillfully. Uh, being with whatever we're experiencing, foundation of, the, of everything, while also including uh, what the Buddha called wise effort, which has two aspects. I summarize as letting go, releasing, preventing, or diminishing what's burdensome, painful, unskillful, unhelpful, unwise, letting it go, and also letting in, cultivating, growing the good, cultivating mindfulness, cultivating compassion, cultivating secure attachment, cultivating a sense of personal value and worth and, and fundamental confidence in yourself, um, cultivating these things. So we have these three fundamental ways of practicing. All three are important. They support each other. Mindfulness is present in all three. Being mindful is not at odds with wise effort. In fact, wise effort is necessary to sustain mindfulness. They support each other. Uh, and as we, for example, let in various what could be called resources, such as a sense of calm in ourself or steadiness of mind or understanding of ourselves or self-compassion, as we let in those resources through letting in, then we become more able to simply be with our experience, including experiences that are quite painful. Uh, as you may have heard me say, I think of the, the mind as like a garden. Uh, and um, as any gardener knows, there are three things we can do with it, right? We can simply witness it, observing it, understanding it, maybe investigating it, but not trying to change it. Um, second, we can pull weeds, not because weeds are bad, but because weeds are burdensome, they're afflictive, they crowd out what's beneficial and helpful and wise and good. We pull weeds and we plant flowers. It's not enough simply to witness the garden. It's not enough to witness it and pull weeds. We also need to cultivate. Certainly the Buddha emphasized this. We need to cultivate wise view, wise intentions, wise actions, wise livelihood, wise speech, wise concentration, wise mindfulness, and all the rest of that. And so all three work together. Uh, I want to say a word about, in a way, <laughs> what's my own specialty, uh, the third of these, the aspect of cultivation. Uh, and I just want to make the point that one thing that we let in certainly are experiences, states of mind. Thoughts, feelings, sensations, intentions, images, etc. We let them in, but it's very important not simply to experience what's beneficial. We need to learn from it as well. We need to help those states, those beneficial states that we've let in, become woven into us in a truly factually, objectively embodied way through becoming gradually hardwired into our bodies notably into our nervous system and its headquarters, the brain. We need to take in the good. So just a word to the wise uh, from one practitioner to, a, to another. Um, when you are, in fact, experiencing something that speaks to you, something that feels good, feels right, feels good. You know, our daughter was talking with us earlier, you know, when I was mentioning what I wanted to talk about tonight. Uh, she's living with us. She's 30, you know, just kind of on her way to her own apartment uh, soon in San Francisco, probably. But anyway, she has a cat and she said, tell them about cats and <laughs> whatever that might be for you. A, a, a cat, a dog, being in nature, being with a friend, making spaghetti sauce, whatever that might be. When you're having a beneficial experience, slow down for a breath or longer. Keep those neurons firing together so that they will wire together. Feel the experience in your body. Recognize what feels good about it. Be aware of what's personally relevant. Open to it. Receive it. Absorb it into yourself so that again and again and again, beneficial states become beneficial traits. You become, you develop trait self-compassion, trait interpersonal courage, trait feelings of worth trait peacefulness about others who may try to quarrel with you. Good things, huh? These can be developed as traits, and as you develop and acquire, as you acquire these qualities of being, 
as traits, they then foster experiences. They foster states, which you can then internalize further to reinforce those as traits in a nice upward spiral. Fundamental comments about practice. Uh, okay, so um, I'm happy to speak to and you know track any questions about that meditation. I saw some comments that that come in. Um, I, I do want to add that if you want to stick around for the breakout rooms, which are really wonderful, just be sure to monitor yourselves, please, so that everybody has roughly equal time to talk and, uh, you know, regulate yourselves so that uh, on the one hand, you, you know, have the courage to speak up, to claim more, you know, claim your fair share of the time, but especially, you know, regulate yourself to make room for other voices. I just want to mention that in passing. Okay. So... Um, if you've been aware at all of sort of the public sphere, it's been a very active 24 hours in America and with implications perhaps for other countries as well. And people have understandably different opinions about it. Uh, I have my opinions about events of the last 24 hours and I have my preferences and so forth. That's all very natural. And I'm certainly not going to sit here and say what I think your opinions ought to be or what your preferences are ought to be. Those are, those are your own, really your own. What I would like to talk about is the interplay, in effect, of love and anger. Uh, the interplay, in effect, of, as T.S. Eliot uh, wrote in his poem, um, I think little getting, but I'm clear on his lines, he says, Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. It's a kind of a supplicating plea to what? The universe, our own wisdom, the divine. Teach us to care and not to care. Teach us to sit still. And that intersection of caring and not caring, we could say the intersection of compassion and equanimity is central in our personal relationships, and it's certainly central in our public life. And it's not so easy to pull off, is it? The combination of those two. But that combination is absolutely fundamental. So I'm gonna speak mainly to the wisdom that could be under the heading of not caring. But to be clear about not caring, I mean it in the wisdom sense of equanimity, not apathy, indifference, not turning away, not uh, just taking one's own privilege for granted, which can be quite easy to do and something I keep practicing with myself, trying not to do that. Um, you know, so when I talk about not caring, I'm really focusing there on qualities of peacefulness and wisdom and an internal balance and stability that underlies or is experienced alongside caring, really caring, being brave, being passionate, being committed, having values, being dedicated, doing what one can, right? So to be clear about it. So under the heading first of caring, I want to offer a few uh, teachings from in the Buddhist tradition that speak to that in a, in a way of honoring and, and, and being real with, sincere. A word I used earlier, I saw a comment that came in that someone appreciated me saying, you know, our own sincerities of what we really care about, of what our commitments really are, our own values. You know, there's no way around caring in some sense we with our our money our time our energy the ways we use resources the ways we vote the ways we speak up what we say we do act in this world there's no way to avoid acting in this world one way or another the only question is how are we doing that and are we doing that wisely so I want to share with you a few teachings of the Buddha that are, for me, short and sweet, that have meant a lot to me. And um, I don't have time to type while I'm talking here. <laughs> and so maybe someone might want to put it in the chat if you can follow what I'm saying. So the first 
is this fundamental teaching I just remember again and again, to avoid all evil, to cultivate good, and to purify one's mind, this is the teachings, this is the teaching of the Buddhas. To avoid all evil, by which is meant, you know, to avoid harming oneself, to avoid harming others, to just not, you know, like Google has a motto, don't be evil, you know, play within the lines, right? Don't cheat. Practice virtue, practice restraint. Uh, sila in Pali is the word for this. So to avoid all evil, to cultivate good, right? Like I was talking about, letting in the good, cultivate the good, including your own well-being, your own release from suffering, your own growing sense of fundamental all rightness, deep down inside, even if many things are far from perfect. Cultivate the good and purify one's mind. A little bit every day, sometimes a lot on some days. Purify your mind. Um, help it become steadier, clearer, you know, releasing more and more of the clutter in it, releasing the dust, <laughs> you know, purifying your mind, developing concentration, developing a fundamental stability of presence. So we have these three things, right? Just keep letting go of the crud. And when you catch yourself, as I do multiple times a day, being a bit cranky or positional or meh, not quite how I want to really be, let it go. Let it go, you know? Second, cultivate whatever is beneficial, qualities you're developing in yourself. Peacefulness, calm strength, contentment and love, cultivation, and train the mind. Meditate for a minute or more a day. Have a growing sense of resting in an underlying spaciousness of, of awareness, of simply being, without being mystical about it, just an underlying quality of simply being, being the sky, as I quoted Pema Chodron in saying, through which experiences flow, purifying your mind. Those three things give us fundamental principles. You know, don't be a jerk. <laughs> Grow the good in your heart, dwell increasingly, and help beneficial things dwell in you. And, you know, gradually purify and liberate your mind. Um, there's a similar kind of teaching uh, that's summarized uh, in the Southeast Asian meditation tradition. Know the mind, shape the mind, free the mind. Know the mind, shape the mind, free the mind. Including in an upward kind of spiral. Okay. Good. So, I want to talk now, and I'm I'm going to I'm going to summarize my my thoughts, my 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 offering here, uh, fairly soon. So then we have time for other people. I want to talk now on the other side of it, of Wow, how do we bring equanimity to bear? Uh, particularly when we're angry, uh, outraged. Uh, I'll just say at a personal level, I feel both appalled and hopeful. You know, how do we practice with feeling appalled? Just morally disgusted in some ways, outraged. You know, how, how can we practice with that? in ways that are skillful, that don't sweep us away, in ways that are harm us and others or make us just despair because we feel so helpless finally. Um, disgust can slide into despair. The longing for justice can become a craving for vengeance. You know, how do we avoid those pitfalls while still caring about what we really, really care about? And I want to offer here, with a little bit of comment, some, for me at least, deep wisdom from the Buddha about this. So, <clears throat> as you may have heard me quote, one of my favorite teachings from the Buddha is, 
One is not wise because one speaks much. One is wise who is peaceable, friendly, and fearless. That, the feeling of that. It's very experiential. You know, for me, Buddhist practice, I, I learned about it initially kind of conceptually, but wow, is it an experiential practice. What's the feeling in your body when you have that combination of friendliness, peaceableness, and fearlessness, right? What's that feel like? That, that, that has a equanimity to it, has a stability to it, right? And then again and again and again, wow, did the Buddha emphasize the compassion and the loving kindness and the goodwill that actually can foster equanimity. Quotation is, with goodwill for the entire cosmos. And it's very helpful to zero in on the particular words. Goodwill. Doesn't mean you agree with everything. Doesn't mean you prefer it. But with goodwill for the entire cosmos, cultivate a limitless heart above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hostility or hate. It's that limitless heart without hostility or hate. And the Buddha was very focused on the afflictions, the mental poison of hostility, hate, and ill will. It's very powerful force. The negativity bias of the brain really fuels aversion. You know, fear, anger, arguably the earliest emotion whose hardware evolved is for disgust, which then can get generalized to disgust at other people for various things. You know, the dirty other. Got to be very careful about that. Very careful about the power of that. And, um, in terms of the development of this balance of teach us to care and not to care, on the not to care side, one of the things that really can get us going in problematic ways is getting swept along by anger. Now, this is tricky because if you belong to any kind of group of people or you were brought up in an environment in which anger was suppressed, my parents had a monopoly on anger in my home, um, you know, I'm not saying anything that's about suppressing what's beneficial in fieriness and, and the ways in which anger organizes the mind and is energizing and can highlight um, outrages, it can highlight issues, mistreatment, injustice. Anger can certainly do that. But on the other hand, anger is a very potent force that can certainly cause a lot of trouble. So I'm not talking about suppressing it, but I'm talking about being careful with it. And here, uh, as best we know, the Buddha says, slay anger and you will be happy. Slay anger and you will not sorrow. Now he means anger here really in the sense of hostility, ill will, destructive, vengeful. You know that feeling where you just want to get them? I know that feeling. There are very few humans who do not know that feeling at least until they become completely enlightened. I think there are a rare few, but not me. So that's what I'm talking about. You know, where you're building up that case in your mind and you're regarding the other as an it, not a thou. You're, you've lost a sense of them as beings. You're looking at them doing whatever they're doing and you're like, Bleh. and you're losing sight of the being behind their eyes. Now, maybe that being behind their eyes is a million miles behind their eyes but you're losing touch with it. That's the kind, that's what is meant here by anger. For the slaying of anger in all its forms with its poisoned root and sweet sting, that is the slaying the noble beings praise with anger slain one weeps no more. And I've started to really watch in my own mind subtleties of annoyance that are just unnecessary. Why did that arise? You know, a metaphor that's used for anger is with its honeyed tip and poisoned barb. Anger of all the so-called negative emotions is the one that feels good often when we're in the middle of it, unlike shame or sorrow or, or anxiety. 
okay, right? That rush of anger feels rewarding. And actually in the brain, um, dopamine and norepinephrine, two neurochemicals associated with you know, pleasurable experiences of some kind are released during anger. So you know, we've got to be very careful about that. The honey tip of anger means we must be very careful about it. Um, also related to that, another quote, knowing that the other person is angry, one who remains mindful and calm acts for one's own best interest and for the other's interest too. Right. And you can see that in people. You can see people, they're, they're strong. They've had it. They're fed up, but they're in control of themselves. There's a fundamental calm clarity in them that they're acting from as they engage things. They may be feeling their anger. They may be, um, uh, you know, having, um, we, we feel it, but I think we all in, find that place where we're not swept away. Now, again, to be clear, It can be relatively easy for me to say these things because I have had a fair amount of good fortune in my life of one kind or another. And I think it's very important to be careful about telling others that they shouldn't be angry about something. I've kind of had it with people who tell other people who have every reason in the world to be pissed off at injustice that they shouldn't be so mad about it. I'm angry. <laughs> about that. I'm not trying to say that at all. I want to acknowledge that. And, you know, we feel what we feel, but I do want to offer the wisdom, I think, from the Buddhist tradition, which I think we can find in other traditions as well, that that anger can be really poisonous, can really carry us away. And the Buddha certainly spoke to that a lot. And what we're left with them is a growing wisdom that sustains compassion even as we recognize injustice, even as we um, say to ourselves, I disapprove of them. They should be ashamed of themselves. I'm going to pursue justice. I'm going to pursue punishment. I'm going to pursue making an example of these people so that others will understand how terrible it is to operate in that way without hatred invading and poisoning one's heart, right? That's our opportunity. And here too is a quotation that to me is relevant. Knowing that the other person is angry, one who remains mindful and calm acts for one's own best interest and for the other's interest as well. Knowing that the other person is angry, one who remains mindful and calm acts for one's own best interest and for these other, and for the other's interest too. So I'm gonna finish here and open it up for you. A lot of wonderful things have come in in the chat. You may wanna take a look at what other people have said. And, um, and um, here's where I just kinda wanna, you know, finish with one of my favorite haiku, which sort of weirdly can put it in perspective. And I'm going to step away from um, the wisdom of my teachers, including my root teacher, the Buddha, uh, and just kind of make a personal comment and then see what you have to say. So one of my favorite haiku comes from Isa. And the English translation that I like uh, from the original Japanese, I'm sure. On a branch floating down river, a cricket singing. On a branch, floating down river, a cricket singing. So here we have it, right? We have a branch in a river, impermanence, change, natural processes. We have a cricket who's doomed, because <laughs> probably doomed. Sooner or later, a cricket's stuck there and is going to starve or fall off the branch. And, well, and yet, singing. Right. goes to the Leonard Cohen uh, cup poem of sorts that I quote from time to time, ring the bells that still can ring.
forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So in some ways, when we look out at the world, and here's my personal comment, two things are true to me side by side. We do what we do. We do what we can, even only as puja, which is, a, I believe, a Hindu term for just simply ceremony. We do this ceremony even if we don't think actually it's going to change anything substantively, but somehow the ceremony itself, the offering of the orange at the altar, the lighting of a stick of incense, you know, the, the saying that we say when we have a meal, whatever it might be, we do it for its own sake. Sometimes we're in situations. I was on the board of an organization for a while, and I began to realize that the board's function was not substantive. It was ceremonial. <laughs> and I was creating a lot of trouble by continually trying to create some substance here. And I finally realized, oh, we're just here to do the puja. You know, we're just here in a ceremonial kind of way, but the ceremony mattered. The ceremony mattered. So maybe that's our form of singing. So, or maybe we, we do what we can. We vote where we can. We send money where we can. We support other people where we can. Um, you know, we, we, we do what we can, right? We do what we can. Well, at the same time, for me personally, when you look at the sweep of history, when you, when you look at the vastness of the world today, um, there's so many things that we don't have any power over. They're going to do whatever they do. They did whatever they did. Throughout history, most people, certainly in the last 10,000 years since agriculture has enabled surpluses that have enabled concentrations of wealth and then power, most people have lived under the thumb of some system or person or another. You know, It's rare to actually function in some form of civil society that has some aspects of democracy in it. And so I'm not saying this to countenance in any way, injustice or authoritarianism or those impulses we see in so many. Um, but it's just to recognize, for myself at least, that it's helpful to me to recognize that um, most of what happens in this world, I cannot change. And I think that I, and maybe I'm not alone here, can get quite preoccupied with and invested in things that are not going well, over which I have little influence, and yet which don't directly affect me very much, while not being focused on and invested in things much closer to home that affect me a lot, over which I actually have a lot of influence. See the disconnect? And I'm not saying this as an excuse to ignore the news or not march in the street or do what one can. I'm just pointing out this kind of weird discrepancy. And I think part of wisdom, my two cents, is to recognize the limitations for our influence and to invest our attention and you know, do what we can for the greater good, including in ceremonial ways as well as substantive ones. Okay. Well, also, you know, investing a lot where we actually have influence and investing our time, our attention, our energy, our practice where in, in areas that actually affect us really, really directly. Okay. So these are hot subjects. I'm observing a little heat in the chat. Cooling, cooling, cooling. Okay. Well, what do you make of uh, my comments? Comments in the chat? Any specific question? I'm seeing a lot of people just basically kind of rolling with what I'm saying. Um, by the way, to be really clear uh, to Barbara, uh, who commented to people directly and to other people. I'm not saying that everyone's views are fine. I'm just saying I'm not going to argue with them. And I'm not going to tell you what I think you ought to think or prefer. That's what I am saying. In my personal life, I definitely put my actions where my mouth is. Okay. Other comments, questions?
I have a real question for you. What helps you find your own personal sweet spot of compassion and equanimity? That's what we're talking about here. People have different sweet spots and at different times. You know, people who know me in my personal life would, would not say that I'm someone who just lets a lot of crap go by. That's how I do it. You know, how do you do it? How do you integrate? I'm seeing things here. Being in nature, making art, tracking nonverbal activity, imagination, the brain, um, right hemisphere. Yeah. I, I find for myself one other thing. <clears throat> Not so much, I mean, we can apply it to politics, but you know, we could bring it home to the living room or the kitchen or your roommate. Um, disengaging from contentiousness. <clears throat> disengaging, you know, finding that sweet spot of being peaceable, friendly, and fearless without getting contentious. And again and again, something will happen. I'll be quite honest here. A little thing will happen. I live with two, I live with three other beings, a cat. <laughs> my wife and a daughter, and um, something will happen. A reaction will arise. And then right there is this choice. The Buddha talked about it as the distinction between the first dart and the second dart. The reaction arises, just it's automatic, it's unbidden over time. We can train ourselves that those reactions don't arise so much in the first place, but in the moment, they've arisen. Okay, there it is, right? And then the real question is, do you take the bait? Do you follow after it? That's the choice. That's the fork in the road. And it's like in half a second, boom, you're in. You've taken the bait. You're into it. In, in a way that actually is unnecessary. I'm not talking about suppressing appropriate assertiveness and calling people on other stuff, if that's really the wise thing to do. But when I rewind, I don't know about you. Maybe you're perfectly, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> just perfect, right? Me, no. Uh, I just observe, particularly with hindsight, you know, instant replay, Holy moly, um, fair amount of time. I could have just let that pitch go right by. You know, there was just no value in getting into it. It wasn't the time I, you know, I was off center. Uh, it wasn't a big deal. Maybe I misunderstood something. I just didn't need to get into it. Uh, or you could just tell the other person didn't have the capacity to engage me in any productive way. And it's been really helpful to be kind of thoughtful about contentiousness and just allow. You know, um, in Tibetan Buddhism, there's this notion of the worldly winds, the eight worldly winds, uh, praise and blame, gain and loss, pleasure and pain, fame and ill repute, so-called. And as Shantideva, the great Tibetan adept, talked about it, um, the worldly winds are gonna blow. You know, gain is coming, great, enjoy it, but recognize that Loss will blow too. Pleasure is here, okay. Pain will be here. Pain is here, there will be pleasure. Uh, people like you, fame, you're getting five-star reviews. That worldly wind is blowing, but you know, there's gonna be another wind. And wisdom over time is to not be so caught up in which way the wind blows, right? And I think the same way in our personal relationships, including related to contentiousness. Okay. Well, Ed Crouch, I see your hand raised. Um, and uh, how about, I think, can you unmute yourself, Ed? Great. There, how's that? Good. All right. Rick, bring it. Thanks for, uh, yeah. It, uh, as it started, I was, uh, I was drawn to something that you said several years back, which is, you know, a way to cultivate uh, good things is to make room for them and uh, a specific tactic that you mentioned was to just not actively resist something that's bothering you but just don't fuel it yeah that's right, right. and and it, it reminds me of the fire triangle right you need something that burns mm. You need some oxygen 
and some heat. Yeah. And we have the capacity in each moment to remove even just one of those elements. And that helps to put the fire out. Yeah. Oh, that's very, very beautiful. Um, but it's yours. Oh, well, well, it is a good point. <laughs> I, I keep thinking about, you know, this experience. So I was on the board at Spirit Rock Meditation Center um, for nine years, actually. And I watched a lot of really beautiful, you know, practiced teachers interact with each other and they disagreed with each other. And I came more out of both a kind of a business background and also a human potential background, which is much more kind of rough and tumble. And I would watch teacher A would make a point and then teacher B would disagree with that point. And I would even think to myself, generally agreeing with teacher A, that teacher B was saying stuff that wasn't actually very true or there was you know some da-da. And then I would... B would finish, I'd wait for A to come back, and A would just sort of look at him, not contemptuously, just thoughtfully, and then let it go. And I was like, what? And yet, actually, and I want to be really clear, I'm not turning that into a rule for life that we should always just let other people say stupid stuff or crazy crap and mean stuff, whatever, and ignore it. But... Um, you know, there was a certain dignity and weight in what was said that just plopped there by staying out of contentiousness about it, you know? And there's a, there was a power to it, including a moral weight. So anyway, that's a little bit of something I tried to learn to do as someone who is good at arguing. <laughs> you often have to be very careful about what you're good at. Okay, well, thanks, Ed. Appreciate that. I see a couple other people. I see someone iPhone uh, asked to unmute, so I'm asking you to unmute there. Hi. Hi. Thank you. What? Um, yeah. Let's see. This is. Uh, I'm so glad you gave this talk. It's something that is extremely present for me. Yeah. Um, and there's. Um, I. I've committed my life just because it's been in me to the well-being of animals, especially dogs. And I'm a dog trainer. Oh. Um, I arranged for a dog that needed a new home to be adopted. And the people hired me as a trainer. Um, and they, uh, um, they, they're, in my estimation, have put their pride in ahead of with the dog's well-being, and um, I'm trying to put it shortly, um, due to their inexperience in adoption, um, they uh, blamed their they they took their discomfort um, with the new dog. Um, and made um, accusations about me misrepresenting the puppy, which was, of course, wasn't true. Um, no. How do I say it? Um, it was out of their own expectations, and I know they didn't know how to deal with their discomfort. Okay. So in any case, there's and now there's a tension. I, I wrote a letter that I spent yeah. two weeks trying to let the my anger subside yeah. um, and worked really hard to be generous and compassionate and had a friend who's skilled at um, nonviolent communication read it over yeah. and was extremely disappointed and and concerned with the response I got back. Okay. I... Um, and right. And I can just say at this point, I want to write a letter that's like, gloves off, this is what I really think. Right. Um, because, uh -huh. and I, I just don't know what to do for yeah. the best interest of the dog right. when I don't know that they can be reached. Yeah. Do you mind if I comment on that? And... No, I want you to Okay. Comment. Yeah. So first off, I'm thinking to myself, you must be wonderful, period, and wonderful with animals, just the way you are 
about it. And I think that's a good place to, to, to recognize, you know, our own sincerity, our own goodness, our own good intent. Not perfect, you know, we don't need to polish our halos, but just to recognize that. So that's where I want to start. Second, I want to say, and this partly relates to, you know, different comments that have come in. For me, I, I don't want to say I think there's a rule because I really don't think there's a rule about when it's appropriate to just let it rip. And I think there's a place in life where people have just fed up to here and they just let it rip. Uh, my, my wife's great in that way, actually. She's normally super mellow, calm, you know, but man, when she finally has had it up to here, boom, she's speaking truth, you know, and sometimes we have to, we just have to free up the energy of anger for, to really release and, and honor and, you know, uh, the, the truth that's there and the truth that other people also really need to recognize. So I, on the one hand, you know, and to be really clear about that. Um, and I think there's certain things that are outrageous and deserve outrage, okay, on the one hand. On the other hand, there's always a question of um, to what effect? You know, what are the stakes on the table? And here's where sometimes the stake on the table is to uh, really powerfully call somebody out for their wrongdoing. Their mistreatment of you, their mistreatment of vulnerable others, such as their animal, their misrepresentation, and just call it. And then the question is how to do that skillfully and effectively, nuances about that. I, I tend to think that if we write in a way that in which we're, we're taking into account how it might be read in a year or a decade, uh, I, I think sometimes there's a video camera recording me interacting with somebody, you know, playing at my funeral, let's say, you know, do I, what do I really want on that recording? You know, that can sometimes help the impact to be, to be better. So, um, so sometimes the, the stake on the table is full self-expression, right? You've got a right to it. That's, your, that's the stake on the table. That, that's what really matters. That's the priority here. That's the prize, is allowing yourself full self-expression, which often is a very appropriate, even if there's some short-term cost, if you're someone who's suppressed yourself or grown up in a culture or been socialized in terms of perhaps gender or ethnicity or social class to just squelch it, stuff it, keep it in. Don't be so annoying, you know? Uh, sometimes... You're just going to let it rip, and you're going to know that it's going to cost you in some ways, maybe, or some other person might read that and go, oh, man, she's really intense. Well, too bad, because what you really care about then and there is, bam, you know, you're going to say it. I've definitely been there, and that was really important to me in my own journey from someone who's in incredibly suppressed to someone who could be more grounded in my power. Frankly, on the zero to 10 intensity scale, the anger scale, as somebody who started out totally capped at a one you know, or a two, and yet through a lot of personal growth workshops, uh, developed the capacity of need be to go to a 10. The fact that I can go to a 10 is, I, I like knowing that. And it also means that I don't need to go there and I can let some stuff go by. I don't need to go there, right? On the other hand, maybe there's a different time where the stake on the table is a professional standing or a long-term business reputation or the knowing that as soon as you put anything in writing, other people can distort it, they can publish it, they can post it on Facebook, they can do all kinds of stuff with it. And you just don't, you know what I mean? So then you, sometimes you, that becomes more the stake on the table, the really important substantive thing. And, you know, these are different ways to think about also long-term relationships with people. Um, little things can really have a long-term impact including in different, you know, family relationships, in-laws, uh, job situations, professional reputations, and so forth. So we, we try to balance all that. Um, so I, I want to just say, for me, there's not so much a rule about it. It's just taking into account what are the priorities for you? At this stage, what are your priorities? What are your values? What are your duties? What do you owe this dog? Uh, what duty, if any, do you now have to these other people who've misrepresented you and Sometimes what we do, frankly, also is we look at a situation or a relationship and we go, it's messed up and it's unfixable. And it's a pity. It's part of the dukkha. It's part of the suffering in this life, the imperfectibility of, of human life for me, which rests in an, in an ultimate kind of perfection of understood in a certain way. Um, and so 
we just go, well, you know, I'm just throwing good money after bad by sustaining this argument here. You know, it's just not worth it. I'm just not going to do it. Uh, so it really depends. I, I, I really do think. I really do think. Um, maybe I'll finish on this one point. I know we've got, I've gone a little long. Also, and this is something the Buddha really, really emphasized. <clears throat> I'll put it in a kind of 21st century, 20th century way. What's in your heart? What's your intention? What's your true intent here? Uh, I could speak for myself. Is the true intent to be right? To be the knower, the smart one, you know, to be morally superior, to make a powerful case, to, to throw that fastball that just strikes them right out. You know, what's the intent? To dominate, you know, to avoid domination? What's the intent? And or what is the intent? Uh, honoring truth. To hell with it. I'm gonna say the truth here. I'm gonna be on record. I don't think that you, let's say the you over there, is going to be open to my truth. You're not going to believe it. You're probably going to try to use it against me. And ultimately, I don't care because I'm here to speak truth on, on the record in some way. You know, well, What's your intent? Uh, is your intent ultimately you know, include a certain compassion for the other, uh, a certain recognition of their own innermost being? What's, what's, what's in your intent? What's in your heart? So that's really the question. And that was something that Buddha incredibly emphasized. What's our intent? That's the origin point morally in terms of the, the virtue or lack of our actions. Where do they come from? You know? And it's okay. Reality is often there's a mixture of intentions. But what are, what's the, what are the intentions that are most governing for you, most central for you? And then as you go forward. And for me, that's the ultimate kind of refuge because the truth is stuff happens. A lot of forces and factors determine outcomes. But what is available to us is what is our intent. When you watch the news and you talk back to the TV screen, as I am known to do sometimes, <laughs> what is your intent in doing that? Maybe it's just to get something off your chest. All right. And with no harm to anyone, really. Okay. Or is your intent to clarify in your own mind how to really think about this and how to talk about it and what you sure wish your team on the playing field of politics would be saying and doing? You know, maybe that's your intent. Or is your intent just proven to your, the other person sitting in the room how smart you are? You know, what's the intent? That's just so, so central. Anyway, I really better wrap up. I, whatever your name is, iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Susan, I'm sorry. Can, I, I just want to I got to finish. No, 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 I really. Yeah, but just thank you so much. Oh, okay. Well, I'll take that. I appreciate that, definitely. And that was short and sweet, too. Uh, you, you said Susan? Is that what you said? Yeah. Susan, yeah. that's great. Awesome. And thank you, Susan, for, you know, clearly I can feel in your heart, in your intent, is care and concern. You know, te teach us to care and not to care. The, and, but the, clearly you, you're strong on the caring side. The exploration might be more on the barking in the background. Yay. On the equanimity side. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, you just helped so much. Please know that you helped so much. Well, I'm really glad. <laughs> I hope you so. Did. Okay, everyone, me included. Let's calm down now. <laughs> Peace, love, dove. Remembering our happy places. Okay, letting it just sort of sink in. Whatever is one little thing, maybe as a, as a feeling of being that you want to dwell in and encourage to dwell in yourself, taking away from this evening, you know, um, maybe some way it's in your heart to be of service to others, you know, genuine way. You don't need to know all the answers. Your, the origin point is your sincere intent to be of help, to be lived by love in some ways. Right? To be a vehicle, a channel through which goodness is expressed out into the world. Resting in that. Maybe that's a takeaway here for you. Resting in whatever you find beneficial and wholesome with my gratitude for you and your practice. Okay, it's a wrap. 
Thank you. Be easy, you know. Don't try not to land. I mean, be you know, like landing gently on ourselves. We're vulnerable, we're soft, we're frail. And be like the cricket. In whatever river you find yourself on whatever log, keep singing. Keep ringing the bells that still can ring. Take good care, and I'll see you next week.